The entire perimeter of this rural Nevada property is surrounded by 10-foot chain fences topped with barbed wire, making it seem more like a prison compound than a family home. But Scott and Susanna, the couple who live there, aren't worried about possible burglars. They're more concerned about protecting the public from their unusual and potentially deadly pets. Their 10-acre property is home to a variety of exotic creatures, including tigers, lions, wolves, and other predators that many would consider too dangerous to keep at home. You don't eliminate the danger. What you do is you mitigate the risk. When it comes to safely keeping predators as pets, the more familiar the animal is with their handlers, the safer the interaction is. Oh, I <laughs> oh, look at that way. <laughs> Susanna is clearly very comfortable with her feline companion. And although the lioness is obviously unsettled by the presence of our camera crew, she shows no sign of threatening behavior towards her keeper. Yeah, that's my girl. That's my girl. <laughs> I know, I know. She can knock me down. <laughs> you scared of that? When Scott first met his partner, Susanna, she already owned some unusual pets, including reptiles and big cats. How did I get this? I met Susanna. I was actually a defense contractor working at the Air Force Base. And when I met her, she was downsizing. She had two tigers and five dogs. And one or two that could have been considered wolf dogs. Even though she is trained in business and economics, Susanna spent most of her life being hands-on with animals, starting as a child riding horses in Eastern Europe. She has been keeping reptiles and dogs since the early 1980s and big cats since the mid-90s. Shortly after I met her, I found out she had tigers, and it was a case of, you, you know, would like to go see my tigers. I was like, oh, okay, we'll go to the zoo. And, you know, she has some that she treats as her own. And what does she do? She hands me a milk bottle and go here and give her a bottle of milk, and you know, I was milk feeding her. At first, Scott was understandably apprehensive about meeting Susanna's bigger cats, but he quickly became familiar with the unique requirements of owning exotic pets. To me, they're like extra large dogs, but that do weigh 400 pounds, 500 pounds, 600 pounds. And you got to take that into account. Uh, when we get animals, we start right away when we get them, no matter if they're you know, three weeks old or six months old, training them on a leash, teaching them that, no, they don't jump on us. No, we're not a play toy. We're here for love and affection and, you know, to move you around. But, you know, we're not going to roughhouse with you and play. You know, we'll give you all the toys you need, give you the playmates or give you the entertainment you need, but not with us. Those playmates generally come from the local dog rescue and act as companions and teachers to the exotic animals. Actually, some of the dogs we got are wilder than the tigers because they're actually born in the wild. And a rescue group picks them up, and you know, we rehomed some of them. And they've ended up with either tiger or liger. And part of the reason we do it is, well, first we do it at young, but it gives them a companion, gives them a playmate, and they learn from the dog how to play because the dog won't allow the rough tiger play. So it tones the tiger down a little bit. My worst animal bite was from two dogs fighting, and I was breaking it up, and I got in, in between, and I got bit instead. They have disagreements, usually at, at feeding time, who gets the biggest piece. It, you'll see that, you know, dogs do that together anyway. 
and they're very respectful of each other, and the dog is usually the boss. And it's not just the dogs that come from rescue situations. Some of the animals here have been surrendered by private owners who learned the hard way that keeping an exotic pet is not at all like keeping a domestic dog or cat. It's a lot of work, a lot of dedication. I know it's not for everybody. It's something you gotta put a lot of thought in if you go into it. But if you want it, you gotta be prepared to deal with a lot of issues. Uh, it's not just, I have this animal and it looks great. No, you, you have this animal and you've got to take care of it because they're completely dependent on you. Scott and Susanna are well aware that taking care of their animal's welfare is a full-time job. You know, you don't do something like this just because it's a cool thing to do. It's not like I can take two weeks off and go to the beach somewhere. No, I gotta worry about them being fed, being watered, being clean, veterinary care for any reason. I'm always sore. <laughs> uh, there's always something to do. Every day is different. It depends on the time of year in the winter because the property is so vast and we have to have water to all the animals. Is you know, If we have freezing temperatures, check to see if water hoses are broken, if water manifolds are broken make sure that animals haven't destroyed something. It's never dull, I can tell you that. We've taken in a lot of animals, and we just take them in like you take an animal from the shelter. It just needed a new home, and we treat them like a pet. In fact, Scott and Susanna even take the unusual step of making sure their pets get enough exercise by walking their big cats on leash. It's a practice that most pet owners are very familiar with, but when the animal you're leading weighs between 300 and 600 pounds and is capable of killing you within seconds, it's a risky activity. And when your predator pet is weary of a camera crew, it's a practice that could be life-threatening. And he's the one that came from Las Vegas Zoo. Yeah. He's an attention hog. He wants to be on camera everywhere. And he's the only one we don't don't leash leash walk because he they were hands off with him, so he doesn't know what a correction is. Um, and he's just perfectly happy, and he's really easy to move because he'll just follow me anywhere. So I'm uh, gonna you know, put a transport cage up to his enclosure, and he'll walk right in for me. Yeah, you really hate it here, huh, buddy? The relationship between human and pet takes on life-changing importance when the animals you're dealing with are highly effective predators, with claws sharp enough to sever blood vessels, teeth that can rip through flesh and sinew, and jaws strong enough to crush bones. Certain people don't want us to have these animals. It's so special that, you know, or so dangerous, I, I shouldn't have it. Well, are you gonna take away my chainsaw too? Because it's so dangerous, I shouldn't have it. I understand some of the stuff on the animal welfare issue, but that should be for any animal. You know, don't have one standard for exotic animals and a different for your dog or house cat. It should run across the gamut. Making one animal more special than the other, it, to me, is wrong. You know, they all should be treated well. American Humane is an organization dedicated to protecting the welfare of animals. Their focus is on the care of captive exotics more than on the debate over whether or not they should be kept in captivity. I am not okay with people who take on private exotics that haven't give a lot of thought to what it's going to entail long term because eventually they're gonna to run to a problem with resources, with care, with land, with security. And unless you have given a lot of thought to that, you're just not in a position to own an exotic like a tiger. The problem is, with a lot of people here in the US, you have some money, you have some means, you have some curiosity, and you think, ah, I'll take on a tiger and see what happens. But it's, it's not a good deal for the tiger, and, and sometimes it's not a good deal for the person. Even those highly experienced with keeping dangerous exotic animals agree that it is not for everybody. 
thing is, can you get a Tiger? Yes. Uh, can you get a Ferrari? Yes. Is it for everybody? No. A Ferrari is not a good family car. I don't think a Tiger is necessarily a good family pet. Never. No. And, you know, this is someone who loves the animal, loves the species. In fact, my favorite animal, and I get asked this a lot, it's not a dog, it's a cheetah. So if I could own a big cat, it would be great. But like for most who own tigers in the U.S., it's a novelty. They shouldn't own them. You know, they don't deserve that privilege of ownership with these animals. I don't think it's thought through in a lot of cases. No, no, even with my experience, my expertise, 20 years as a vet, I would not own a tiger. There are an estimated 10,000 big cats living in captivity in the United States. The majority are privately owned, and in many jurisdictions, people can keep a big cat on the property without reporting it to local officials or even to their neighbors. People think, hey, you have a tiger, what if it gets out? Well, the fact is, especially with tigers, or any big cat, if they've gotten out, nothing's happened. There's no record of any big cat attacking, much less killing, anybody off the property. It's always on the property, on their territory. More of a case of you, as a person not used to being around tigers, would not know how to react properly if a tiger charged at you. Versus me, is I know what to do, you know, I can break it off in two seconds. You will turn and run, and all of a sudden, you know, you have a tiger crawling up your back. Animal attacks often occur when people react in a way that the animal doesn't understand or simply hasn't seen before. Like with the wolves, part of their greeting is mouthing. And they'll just come up, you know, put their mouth on your arm. They're not biting down or anything, but if it was anybody else that doesn't know that, they yanked their arm away, and all of a sudden they got mauled by a wolf, and when the wolf had no intention of doing that. Animals put in unfamiliar situations are often more afraid of humans than we are of them, and that's when an encounter can become deadly. In other cases, owners are teaching their pets bad habits. And a lot of it comes from not knowing what they're doing. And some people just do the wrong things uh, in raising them, I remember seeing one video of a, one guy that used to play tug of war with his tiger at feeding time, you know, play tug of war. Well, his daughter ended up putting her arm in the enclosure and the tiger did what it was trained to do, play tug of war. And it's instances like that where, you know, the injuries and deaths come along. And the people being injured are the handlers, owners, or people in and around the big cats. And it's very simple. It's sort of like, if you don't want to die by skydiving, don't go skydiving. If you don't want to be injured by a big cat, don't go where the big cats are. So just why are Scott and Susanna willing to go where the big cats are? For the love of the animal. There's nothing like it when they come up and seek a reassurance from you. Something makes it nervous. It's like, is it OK? Yeah, yes, it's OK. Yeah, you can go do it. About 95% of what I do it for is for the animal, whichever animal it may be. Some animals are more affectionate than others. You build a stronger relationship with certain ones. The ones you raise from three weeks old or the one that you get four months old, it's just how the relationship develops. Australia is made up of two-thirds of desert. It's a harsh place for any animal to survive. This one has adapted perfectly to its environment. The dingo is a carnivore that was introduced from Asia around 5,000 years ago. And it has thrived in Australia ever since. A subspecies of the wolf, they can be seen as a pest by farmers and are known to kill livestock. But can they be a good pet? Dave Graham recognizes the dangers, but has chosen one as his companion. While it's rare to see a pure white dingo, what makes this one even more unusual is that the owner has fallen in love with her. 
Do I consider Alice uh, a pet or a best mate? I think, I think she's like my girlfriend. I can't be without her and I don't think she can be without me. She owes me, she controls me, she's, oh my God. We have some arguments, but she always wins and she runs the household. She runs everything that we do. Dave is a farmer and a qualified animal behaviorist from Queensland. And from his experience working with dogs, he totally understands the genetic makeup of the dingo. The dingo is quite literally a dog that has gone back into a wolf-like state. When they first came to Australia, they went straight back into the bush and have become that wolf-like creature with the five elements that all the dogs that we now have have been bred out from. Dingoes have everything. They track, that's sniffing out their prey. They stalk their prey, which is where we've now got all of our herding breeds come from. They chase down their prey, which of course is our hunting dogs that we now have. Uh, they consume, rip apart their prey. And then of course, they also have that social aspect. They do work together. They really do work in packs. Using their paws, uh, using their teeth, really rip anything apart and they can get right inside, get the exact part of the, the animal that they want to eat with the amazing dexterity that these guys have. Farmers have blamed dingoes for causing large amounts of damage to livestock. As a farmer, Dave has witnessed some of the damage done to his sheep by wild dogs. When you grow up in the outback on uh, the inside of the, the dingo fence, uh, you have a difficult relationship with wild dogs. So my entire life, I've always seen uh, wild dogs as an enemy because I've seen the damage that they've done on our livestock, on my sheep. There were some nights that, um, that they would come in and, and take out 90 odd sheep, but not kill them, just, just rip them apart. And my job, of course, was to come through and, and uh, and put them down in a humane way. And uh, that was always difficult for me to um, appreciate the beauty of the dingo in the bush, but also the, the damage that they can um, bring to our farms. The dingo fence, the world's longest fence, originally built in the 1880s as a rabbit-proof fence, was converted in the 1940s into a dog barrier to protect sheep and cattle from dingoes. Over 5,000 kilometers long, and spread across three states, it has been partly successful in stopping dingoes from crossing the border and killing livestock. The dingoes that managed to get through were often shot by farmers as they were considered pests. So how does anyone consider this a safe pet? It's been a long journey for me to appreciate how beautiful and how valuable dingoes are to our bush, but I I'm under absolutely no delusion whatsoever that, uh, that wild dogs and vulnerable animals um, mean lots of blood. There is a contradiction. In his farming life, Dave had to destroy wild dogs that were killing his livestock. Alice was the one dingo that stole his heart. Alice was found uh, about three and a half years ago I was on the inside of the dingo fence in the outback of New South Wales, where wild dogs um, are exterminated. A farmer came across a litter of pups in a den, and uh, as he was putting them all down, after he'd already put the mother down, of course, one of these offsiders, who was a contractor from the city, said, no, I really want to keep the white one. So he did, and took it back to the city and learned very, very quickly that dingoes are not dogs. You have to be extraordinarily skilled and you have to have extreme management plans and also very, very, very good fences to be able to keep a dingo in because they are wanderers and they don't require human interaction. And that's what uh, allows these relationships to flourish. In a well-managed situation, it is possible to have an incredible relationship with a dingo as Dave has with Alice together with an appreciation of the role of the dingo in the ecology of Australia. Look, she has 100% trust with me. Yeah, our whole relationship is built on a mutual trust. She knows I won't drop her or hurt her, but it's her favorite thing. Hold her upside down and she's happy. She'll be there for hours, <laughs> but just loves it. <laughs> but all dingoes love it. Anyone that has a dingo, that's what you do. You hold them upside down and then they're, they're happy.
Mark from the Armadale Reptile Center looks after two dingoes, Kai and Jay, who were both previously kept as pets. When the owners discovered how much maintenance was required to keep them, Mark agreed to take the dingoes into his care. This is the great problem with a lot of people with pets. They don't think about it first. They go by feelings, not by their head. You can't just buy them on a whim. They're not like pups. Pups will fit in. They're very, very forgiving. Dingoes aren't really forgiving. Mark has had to work with the dingoes to gain acceptance from them. In particular, the older dingo, Kai, who is the alpha male, took longer to accept him. I've had Kai growl at me to start off with. Eventually he accepted me, but I couldn't go near Kai. Jay was fine. He was younger though, he's a little pup. That's the way he acted, but the other one backed off and he growled a little. And when they growl, you stand back. Unless they're humanized, they'll keep away from people. But in areas like Fraser Island where people feed them, they get used to it. And uh, if you don't feed them, they'll attack you. Fraser Island is a heritage area situated off the coast of Queensland, which has a population of protected dingoes. The public are giving guidelines to be dingo safe while on the island, for very good reason. There have been many cases of people being bitten by dingoes on Fraser Island, including a nine-year-old boy who was fatally attacked in 2001. Look, what I try and do with Alice is educate people that you need to be respectful of any wild animal in its environment. It's king, and you have to respect it. Don't go near them. Don't feed them, don't do anything except for appreciate that they are doing their job by existing in the bush as Australia's apex predator. When you start to feed a wild animal, it's going to start to lose the fear, and then as soon as it loses fear, well, then it's going to look for food uh, when you're not supplying it, and you may come into conflict. Alice is an albino dingo, and it must be remembered that at her core, she is a pure blood and there is always a risk that the wolf within could come to the fore, something that Dave never forgets when he takes her into the public domain. They are predators. There's no two ways about it. They develop their wild instincts as well. One of the ways they show their being alpha is height. They like to get up above you, looking down on you. As you notice, our fences are six foot high and they angle back into the enclosure. That's so they can't climb out, because they can climb a six foot fence. They're a wolf. Anything that gets in their enclosure is food. Doesn't matter what it is. A rat runs through or something like that, they'll eat it. A bird flies low, they'll catch it. A young child could upset one and it could snap, and they do have very powerful jaws. They'll kill very quickly. You can't stop that. While attacks on humans are relatively uncommon, one of the most well-known dingo attacks occurred in 1980 near Uluru, Central Australia. Lindy Chamberlain, mother of nine-week-old baby girl Azaria, was convicted of her murder. The Chamberlains maintained their baby was taken from their tent by a dingo. And in 1986, following the discovery of Azaria's jacket near a dingo lair, Lindy Chamberlain was immediately released from prison. In 2012, following years of speculation and inquiries, the coroner concluded that the cause of Azaria's death was as a result of being attacked and taken by a dingo. When you ask people instantly, they think of Lindy Chamberlain, the terrible death of her daughter by the jaws of a dingo. So that's prevalent in people's minds. But I think we do have a love affair with dingoes because they're just so strange, so distant and so rare. I mean, you would be hard pressed to find too many Australians that have seen a real dingo in the wild because they naturally just blend in to the environment. 
that's the job and that's why for hundreds of years of white settlement and of course the thousands of years that they've been here during Aboriginal settlement, they have just inserted themselves into the ecology. But at the same time, these guys are using those jaws every single day to um, get through life. And uh, when you need to eat to survive, it brings you up against humans because we're growing animals out there, sheep, cattle, goats, pigs, and of course these guys are hunting in that same territory. So we do really have a love-hate relationship in Australia. Alice has a natural tendency to investigate her surroundings a trait that's typical of a dingo. She uses her highly tuned senses to great effect around the house. One of the things that makes dingoes different from dogs is that dingoes love to climb. They're up on top of everything, into everything. It doesn't matter how small the surface is. They need to check it out thoroughly and know what's going on in their environment. Yeah, she loves getting up on top of things, but it's really this super investigation and this crazy brain that just needs to know exactly what's going on. They always look like they're chilled, but I think it's because, well, they've got a lot to think about that they've just investigated and they're just going through all their different TV shows that they've got inside their head of all the different adventures they've been on. One could be easily mistaken after seeing Alice's relationship with Dave that dingoes make an ideal pet. The reality is that Alice is a wild animal and by her very nature is a predator. Are we ready? You're being very good to I love my dingo, but uh, they do not make good pets. They are a wild animal that belongs in the wild. It's just that at the moment I belong to Alice. They don't bark, which seems great but they do everything else that could possibly drive you crazy. They shed continuously. Everything gets covered in dingo hair. They get into everything, and of course, trying to contain them is almost impossible. But at the end of the day, they don't need us. They don't need to be looked after us. And when you've got several hundred breeds of dog to choose from, I'd stick with dogs. It's clear that dingoes are a high maintenance animal and anyone who tries to domesticate one will have limited success. Dave, who has a license to keep Alice, has worked with dingoes for many years and knows what's involved to keep Alice under control for her own safety and the safety of others. It doesn't matter where I am, Alice will always be tethered to me or tethered to one of my domestic dogs. It's just a case of if she feels that she needs to run off on a trail, she will run off on a trail after a rabbit or after a rat and she's gone. So I've got to make sure that she is absolutely safe at all times. At the end of the day, she is magnificent. She is an incredible, loving, adorable friend who, um, she's just so sweet. but. It, you've got to always remember, she's a wild animal. And not that she could turn in any second, not that she's unpredictable, but she is predictable. She will fight to survive. And uh, that's what they've been doing in this country for five to 8,000 years. So it's not that I don't trust her, it's that I do trust her that one day she could bite and could really do some serious damage. 68% of American households own at least one pet, and many are choosing to own animals that could be considered exotic. The legal definition is subject to local jurisdiction, but generally an exotic pet is one that is rare, unusual, or a wild animal, not typically kept by humans. Often, that's because those animals can be deadly. It's better to be bitten by an angry snake than a hungry snake, because a hungry snake won't let go for a while. But, uh, but they're, they're very popular and should not be kept around small children uh, because the small children are edible. More than 20 years ago, Ken Foose opened a reptile and exotic specialty store. And it's the type of store that is getting harder to find in the U.S. The animals he sells range from those that can just give you a nasty bite to those that can kill in a matter of minutes. This is our second largest selling animal. You would think us being a reptile store, it would be all reptiles, but this, this is a, a, a pygmy hedgehog. They're very popular. We sell hundreds of these. 
and I wouldn't own one if you gave it to me. But, um, but we saw a lot of them. It's basically an animated rock. Regulations around owning exotic pets are different in every state of the U.S. In Nevada, pretty much anything goes. There's not a lot that we can't have. Uh, I mean, I can have a tiger in here for sale. Why would I? Uh, I'm not qualified to own a tiger. Most of the people I know are not qualified to own a tiger. It's the same thing with primates. We used to sell, we can sell monkeys here. We can sell chimpanzees. We can sell anything we want. But 99% of the people on this planet are not qualified to own a monkey, period. And I'm, I, I sold monkeys for five years, and I just got tired of looking for that 1%. Foose's biggest selling pet may not look frightening, but as a carnivore, it certainly can bite. It can also be dangerous to the environment, and that's why it's illegal to own one across the border in California. You can own a snake, a tiger, or even a bear, but you can't own a ferret. Many of Ken's customers are committing an offense when taking their new furry pets across the state line from Nevada. But Ken is very careful that he doesn't break the law when selling animals, including ferrets. He even plays a role in lobbying government to ensure that regulations surrounding the keeping of exotic and dangerous pets are relevant for both animals and owners. My, my biggest concern with keeping dangerous reptiles and amphibians, I'm talking about rattlesnakes, uh, large constrictors like, like him or, or something that is potentially life-threatening. If someone comes in here and buys a rattlesnake from me, I, of course, quiz them. How are you doing this? Where do you live? I ask them where you live because in the county, they're not going to let you have one. In the city of Las Vegas, you're required to have a permit. And I wrote the regulations for the permit. If you live down the street and you said you were qualified to keep a rattlesnake, I'll sell it to you. And if you die, or your wife dies, or your kids die, your dog dies because of the snake, I don't care. I mean, you know, your choice, I don't care. If the three-year-old girl living three doors down in her backyard gets bit by the snake because it escaped from your house, that I care about. And the reason is people die from hamster bites. People die from all kinds of animals. And when you accept the risk that comes with owning an exotic animal, you've accepted the risk. Animal ownership laws and regulations are constantly changing, and Ken's whole team are passionate about supporting animal owners' rights. They went from, we were able to keep any size snake, really, to, OK, well, now you can keep a snake that's typically under 12 feet, but you need to have this permit and this. And the permit's the same as where you would have on a sloth or a um, hi, buddy, or anything bigger that requires bigger space. I have to sit there and notify every one of my neighbors. I have to measure from my front door to the edge of my street, from the back door to the edge of the street, the back door to my fence line. It's just government overreach, wanting to know everything that you keep in your house and why you're keeping it. And it's something that we fight for. I mean, all of us that are passionate fight for and come together and try to make sure that those laws don't pass. Staff member Georgia has 48 reptiles, including several ball pythons, a reticulated python, a couple of boas, some iguanas, some red-footed tortoises, a water monitor, and that's not all. Um, nine ferrets, the genet, five dogs, three cats, and a bunch of rats. <laughs> like many exotic pet owners, George's life would be turned upside down by more restrictive animal laws. I think I would do my best to move because I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to give up that's like my thing, that's, you know, I love them all, so I wouldn't, I would leave. <laughs> as fun as ferrets may be, they'd be easy prey for many of the other animals in Ken Fuse's store. Though Nevada has strict ideas about which snakes locals are allowed to keep as pets. Only venomous snakes native to Nevada and rear fang snakes are allowed to be kept in the state. There are two types of venomous snakes those that inject venom through fangs in the front of their mouths, like rattlesnakes or cobras, and those with fangs at the back of their mouths. They chew the venom into their prey. And then there are the snakes that can literally squeeze the life out of you. 
This is a uh, tiger reticulated python. Uh, it's about 15 feet long. Air gas grabbed the other end of this. My back won't handle this. Uh, they do very well in captivity. Like I said, the only real downside to them is they get too big. Um, if a snake like this bites you, you're gonna know it. And you'll bleed. They're not deadly. They won't kill you. But they'll, they'll, they'll hurt you a little bit. And snakes aren't the only creatures in store with a venomous bite. Uh, this is a beaded lizard. They come from uh, Mexico and Central America. Uh, they are, they are venomous. Uh, they've got these um, venom glands in their lower jaw. And they don't have fangs, but they have very, very sharp, jagged teeth. They're actually really easy to keep, and they're generally pretty mellow. But it's also the excitement you've got a beaded lizard. They, um, you know, there's something romantic about having one. Beaded lizards can grow to three and a half feet long and are related to the Gila monster. They're the only two venomous lizards in the world and can deliver an extremely painful bite. And they just tend not to let go. Uh, they will hang on to you uh, forever. There is no anti-venom for this. They, they won't kill you. Years ago, we had um, someone break into one of the cages and stole one of our beaded lizards. Uh, and it was a baby, it was about four inches long. And he put it in his pocket. As he reached into the cage to grab it, he got bit. And then when he put it in his pocket, he got bit again. And ended up uh, going to the hospital. So he recovered, he made a full recovery, and in fact came into the store about a year later and stole something else from us. But we caught him that time. Yeah, but they're very, very cool, and, and people like them because they're a novelty. They're different, they're not lethal. Uh, it's not an animal that can kill you. It's almost like the throat, same thing, there's a lot of people that keep rattlesnakes and cobras and, and things like that. And I think it's just the novelty of it. People that just really like venomous reptiles. Uh, I can understand it, I don't own any myself, uh, but I used to. And there's kind of a thrill there, and they're very, very neat. And it's not just venomous reptiles that people consider exciting pets. Arachnids, better known as scorpions and spiders, are also a popular, if not unusual, companion. Nothing elicits as much fear in so many as the spider. Yet, exotic pets staff member Gaz has been fascinated with them from a young age. I was about eight years old, and my, my first pet was uh, two leopard gecko lizards. And then after that, it was a tarantula, a rose hare. Yeah, that's, uh, they, they were my first kind of pets. And then like, my mum didn't like snakes, so I got a corn snake from a friend of mine, and I had to keep it hidden. I had it hidden for a year before my mum found out. The largest of the spiders, tarantulas, may appear deadly, but their venom won't kill you. That's not to say that their large fangs won't cause some damage or that their venom is completely harmless. You know, there's certain species of tarantulas that it's not recommended to handle. Um, like some of the old world species, like the Pocletheria. You know, they're, um, you know, from like India, Sri Lanka, those areas. Um, they, they, they've got a pretty potent venom. It's gonna make you feel pretty rough for a few days if you get bitten by one of those. That's a Goliath 30, and now they are very big, very big fangs, and very aggressive, so it's really not recommended to hold those guys. Large fangs and potent venom aren't a tarantula's only means of inflicting pain on their human owners. As a defense mechanism against larger predators, many species of tarantulas flick tiny hairs off their abdomen. These hairs can irritate the eyes, nose, and even the lungs. So this is a new world species, so they've got these urticating hairs, which is their first line of defense is to flick these hairs. So they're, they're a little bit docile, you know, so they're not prone to bite. Their first line of defense is to flick hairs. So I wonder if it'll do it. See how he's, he's rubbing his back legs now, in his abdomen, that flicks up these hairs. So he's a bit of a hair flicker, but usually a species is not too bad. Oh yeah, they've got fangs and uh, you know, they've got venom, just like all spiders. There are more than 1,700 different types of scorpion 
though only about 20 of them have venom powerful enough to kill a person. The most dangerous scorpion, the Indian Red, could kill you within 24 hours. Uh, yeah, I mean, just a few weeks ago, I was stung by an emperor and a nation. I was, you know, I was just being foolish, you know. But yeah, they're actually a really easy going. Yeah. Don't threaten them, and they do pretty good. Yeah. I mean, the things with these, you want to be more worried about their pinch than the sting. Their pinch is really hard, and they don't let go. They'll, they'll make you bleed. Yeah, they'll make you bleed, man. It's real hard. But their sting, like I said, got stung by them. Once again, it was like a wasp sting, you know, a little bit of irritation for about 30 minutes, and that's it. As long as you don't, because uh, that's a big stinger. See the yeah. stinger in there? It's like a nail going into your hand. And it's not just teeth and fangs you have to watch out for. Many of the animals, Ken sells, can hurt you in more than one way. There's a risk to anything. I mean, it's like I said before, it doesn't matter whether it's a hamster. There's always an inherent risk. Uh, of course, we would tell people this is a rear fang state. Be careful. But, uh, but beyond that, this is not another animal that could never hurt you. But the venom is, uh, is, is not strong enough to do more than like localized swelling. Um, the snakes, the, the, the animals that I have in here, quite frankly, that, that hurt you the most are things like these. Claws. It's, it's, the, the, it's the teeth and the jaws and, and the claws. These, these are not from snake bites. These are from these people's, these animals' toenails. Now these, the key thing here, there we go. The key thing with these things is you control the legs. And that way you don't bleed. This is what I call tame. Um, uh, when they first came in, there's no way I could hold them like that. I would be bleeding all over the place. Uh, I've never seen one try to bite, but they rip you to pieces with these very sharp claws. So many of the animals in Ken's store have bites that can rip skin or inject venom or claws that can draw blood. Why would anyone want to own them? They're just such cool animals, you know? It's just, they're, you know, they're, I've always found them fascinating. Um, from from the, the tiniest of little, like, common house spiders, you know? It's just beautiful. They're just fascinating animals, man. I've always been fascinated by them. It's the thrill. It's it's why do people race cars or or hang glide? It's everybody has their own adrenaline fix and that they've chosen. And this is a lot of people. This is it. And for as long as there is a demand for exotic pets, Ken Fus and his team will continue to fight for the rights of animal owners to keep them. Not everyone should keep a lizard. Not everyone should keep a dog or a cat or even a mouse. Uh, why would anyone have the big python or have, have this or have that? And I'm like, people jump out of perfectly good airplanes every day. Why? Are you going to ban skydiving? And there, there are a lot of these legislators say they're trying to protect us from ourselves. Well, if you're going to protect us from ourselves, uh, ban smoking or ban drinking or ban skydiving, or car racing, or football. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we do to hurt ourselves, and we do it on purpose. So it's, it, it makes absolutely no sense to uh, you know, ban something that actually as benign as this. In the course of raising animals and having certain ones, sure, I've gotten bit before. You, you can't be in it 50 years and not have had an incident here or there for, for whatever reason it might have been at that time. And generally, it's been my own fault. Here, come here. Easy, ah, ah, easy. See, that's him. He's actually very happy about that. He just wants to play in the worst way. Although this attack was unexpected, for Luke the Lion, this was apparently playtime. See, like that, jumping on me, that was all, he's all happy. But you see how he was stalking in the bushes? He thought, oh, and it's a big game to him. Yeah, it's, it's all him saying hi. He has his claws, but 
he didn't use them. I mean, because a lot of times, just, just in play, ah, 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 ah. you see that? That's hot. You can't go under the trailer. Mm -hmm. Steve isn't too bothered by the game Luke is playing. He's worked with exotic animals for around 50 years, and he's seen this kind of behavior before. Lions are quite social animals, and within their pride, they are often affectionate with head rubbing, licking, and purring. However, no matter what your experience working with lions, these animals are quick, and they are predators with speed on their side. Very, very quick. Say if you were uh, clear at the other end of this pen, and he was here, you would never outrun him. He would catch you, for sure. I mean, they are extremely fast when they want to be. A lion can run up to 50 miles per hour, but only in short bursts. So they need to be close to their prey before they attack. But generally, lions are a sleepy bunch, and they like to lay around with their pride for around 18 hours a day. They look at us as a dominant member of whatever species. We're talking about lions, so it's lions. They want to do what they do to their fellow lions. We just don't like it when they bite and claw us. So we curtail that. Hi. Yes. Chris Edrington works alongside Steve Martin, training animals to work in film and television. This is a job that requires incredible skill, knowing what makes these beasts tick. Easy. He's like a teenage boy. They stretch the limit sometimes. It's the energy you see is a lot of that. By the time they're five or six, they're much more mellow. They might be more mellow as they get older, but getting up close to a lion isn't for the inexperienced. If you didn't know what you were doing, it could be very dangerous. I mean, because he, ah, 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 ah. you got to watch that. He'll jump up and grab it. Oh, he's watching the, the rabbit in the sky. Oh, no, he eventually would jump at it and <laughs> go crunch, crunch. The boom is a great game for Luke. Luke is an experienced animal actor, so the boom is a familiar sight. But Steve knows he needs to keep the boom well away from Luke's reach. This is all part of professional animal training, and Steve Martin is one of the best trainers in the business. See, we teach him a mark. It gives him a place to go to, like if the director said, we need him to come out from behind the bush and come stop there and then run off. We teach him a mark so we can call him to an exact spot. And I tell him, all right, and then Chris would call him off. If you watch uh, a lot of shows, you'd start picking up on that, that, oh, OK, I get it now. Because you see him come up, skid to a stop in an exact spot. Usually, it's always a trained behavior to go to that. When it comes to training, it's all about repetition. If you want to train a lion to perform on cue, it needs to be second nature for them. As they get older and as they learn stuff, mm -hmm. Uh, 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 no. Go on. He wants to rub on me and say hi. As they, uh, as they get older and they learn stuff, they learn how to learn. And where that might have taken us 20 or 30 times of doing it before he goes, oh, oh I, I got what you want now. You notice how he went out and got on it right away? After a while, you get on set and they go, oh, we, can he do this or that? And I say, well, he doesn't really know us. Give us a few minutes and usually we can get them to do it. Lions have been used in the film industry for many years, from Leo, the MGM lion, and the black and white era, to a wide variety of blockbusters still being made today. When the lion forgot his lions. Maybe he was tired of retakes, but he suddenly turned on Bigford and gave him a bad mauling. To Bigford, however, it was all in a day's work. Lions have long been associated as the fierce aggressor in popular culture. But there's also a softer, more endearing side, as well as being the star of slapstick comedy. In the business we're in, we don't say they're pets. They're working creatures. Even though we have a very strong attachment with them and them with us, usually we always try to get an animal and, and hand raise it. Because it's not like getting an animal, oh, this is no good, we'll get rid of him, get another one, yeah, get rid of him. Usually when they come to us, they're here to stay. <laughs> I and mean, we do this as a business. And also, you know, I've been in it, I hate to even admit, since 1967. So I've been in it a lot of years. And 
you know, we like our animals. We spend a tremendous amount of time. These guys are here every day, seven days a week. And, and uh, I have other trainers too that are very dedicated to all of them. So you build up really strong bonds and relationships with these guys, as you can see. Luke was donated to Steve as a baby from a park in South Carolina. So this young cub has grown up with Steve by his side. This relationship makes it hard to believe that in the wild, a lion can be so dangerous. Oh yeah, he's, he'll be a real good animal. He's, uh, you know, like you can see how excited he is all the time. As he gets older, hopefully the, the excitedness will settle down a little bit <laughs> because I've been gone for three weeks. So this is pretty normal for him to constantly want to greet you. Oh, I know, it's okay, just relax. <laughs> The relationship between Steve and Luke, like all Steve's animals, is one of great respect. But for Steve, he prides himself on being able to create such a wonderful bond with his movie stars. I'm relaxed, but I'm also aware of what's going on. I mean, there's a lot of people that really think they know what they're doing and don't. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the private sector that do have animals, you know, they get these animals and they raise them as babies and, and they're real rambunctious and, and they think because my little girl was around it when it was this size that she can be around it, my daughter, my son or whatever, when they're full size. It's a whole different mentality. Animals, like humans, grow through varying stages of maturity. Playful when young, but when the predator instinct kicks in, these trainers need to be on their game. The cats are a bit more of a predator than a lot of animals, like bears, for instance. They're not necessarily a real predator like these guys are, and they're a little more intelligent in, in that direction, where these guys basically, they respond out of you know, contact, and, uh, and uh, well, their main drive is being fed for what they're doing. You see what he's doing right now? He's going, he's begging. He says, Chris, Chris, give me a piece. That's it. You a good boy? Huh? <laughs> no, quit. Juan Stewart is a vet with American Humane, and part of his role is to ensure the safety and well being of all animal actors. I frequent sets and even the animal companies that provide these dangerous animals to the films. I've had experience and time around a lot of them. You can go back and forth, and you may have a moment where you're with someone who's very experienced, has the expertise, and you would say, I feel safe. I think the people around these animals are safe. And then you'll have a moment with someone else who doesn't have the experience or the wherewithal. And you know immediately that that animal poses a threat, potentially a lethal threat, to that person and the people around them. For Steve and his team of professional animal trainers at Working Wildlife, every animal is special. Whether it's a big cat, chimpanzee, or even a bear, this is one of the top go-to companies for animals in high-end TV commercials and blockbuster movies. For such a setup, being vetted is important for their reputation. The American Humane, we have them come up all the time. They brought somebody from Australia, from New Zealand, and around the world and they want to see how you handle your animals because they have humane departments throughout the world and we call them and ask them to come because there are certain groups out there which i won't say their names <laughs> but uh, you are highly against what we do because they think we starve and beat our animals and all that so i don't know how you could take an animal you abused on a set with like 200 people and not have it kill you, <laughs> you know? So it's, they're all, it's all a positive reward system in all the training that we do. With so much experience, the working wildlife training is a slick operation. But for the animals, it's often about playtime and fun. They know there's a reward on offer if they hit their mark. These creatures leave it up to the trainers when it comes to the serious side of the business. When we're on set, we usually are pretty strict. Like I always take three people. Those other two people, they're not just watching what I'm doing, they're watching what's going on. I'm watching exterior things, 
And sometimes I'll see somebody, like with these guys here, if you used to have somebody, one person, you got 50 people here and one person out over there, like peeking behind a tree or something, they pick up on that right now. And right away you'll see them like this, uh oh. I said, who's, and you can see them out there. So we try to keep a handle on all exterior stuff that's going on when we're working. One of the stars in the animal lineup is a Kodiak bear named Tag. He's obedient, playful, and likes a crispy treat or two. But when you're working with bears, it's always best to be cautious. Bears can be very dangerous. I mean, under the wrong circumstances. Even though he's real nice, very, uh, He's very good about things, very forgiving. No matter what, he's still a bear. You know, you always have to take that into respect. You do the wrong thing and at the right time, and you could, you could set him off for one reason or another. So we're, we're very careful about what we do and how we do it. And we've actually had him in houses and various things. And, but, you know, we go and check everything out before we are ever going to do a job in certain situations and make sure it's safe for him and for the people. Tag is clearly one of Steve's most beloved bears, and he is so switched on that he's worked out it's very much to his advantage to be well-behaved in order to get a few extra rewards. He's not real keen on chocolate, usually. I like that. It's because it's got peanuts in it. I mean, sometimes I offer him like a chocolate bar and he'll put his nose on it. Yeah. Well, bears are very, very smart, and you can teach them a lot of things. One of my favorite is lions. I really like the cats. But these guys are, they have a different intelligent level compared to a cat. A cat's more primitive, where these guys are, the primitiveness isn't as strong in them as it is in the cats. So they're a little smarter. I, th I think they, they definitely think about, if they didn't like somebody, it's always back there in the back of their mind, you know, and if the opportunity arose, they could probably take advantage of it. But you have to be careful because they do have their claws. You know, none of these animals, as you can see, are declawed. Tag is so popular, he even travels overseas to take a starring role in the movies. He's very socialized with people. I mean, actually, him, we can work in close proximity, like the thing we just did in South Africa is with Johnny Knox and him, and we taught him to drink beer. I mean, it wasn't beer, it was, uh, we put the Dr. Pepper in a beer can. But the two of them are sitting down drinking together and they high five each other with their beer. We had two days prep down there and did all the sequences they wanted, so. He's a very adaptable bear because he's had so much exposure that he's, when he goes to a new place, he knows it's a, it's a game. Oh, here's my name. Here's your animal cracker. Come on. You're too lazy to get up and get it, though, huh? Bears have different appetites depending upon the time of year. In spring through to summer, they'll eat three to five gallon buckets of food a day. But in the cooler months, it's about a half a bucket. Well, it's, yeah, their whole system slows down this time of year. You're a lazy worker right now, aren't you? It seems Steve has Tag well-trained. However, these animals all have predator instincts that should never be disregarded. But with safe practice in mind, the working relationship between animal and trainer can be full of rewards. You can see in this guy, he picks up on things real quick. So, you know, at first we start teaching him, like I said before, it's, it's a, a slower process, but as, as they learn how to learn, they, they kind of, like these bears, they'll just kind of look at you like, oh, okay. And so you pick it up real fast. Shake it, shake it, shake it. Good. Good boy. Good boy. The animals are always the number one priority at working wildlife. And Steve has an incredible setup where the animals only spend a small amount of time in their enclosures. On a property this size, the animals get to roam in dedicated open spaces while they prepare for their next starring role. The 
fear of snakes is one of our most common phobias. But why do we have such an adverse reaction to snakes, even though most of us have never seen one in the wild? Snakes are found on every continent except Antarctica, and there are over 3,600 species slithering across them. Most are non-venomous, but the ones that are venomous can kill, which gives all snakes this bad reputation. However, John Can and his snake-loving family find them irresistible. People are scared of snakes because of the unknown factor. And even when you fully explain it to them, there's no danger if you're careful. They've still got that phobia there, they're concerned. The main thing is you don't try to pick him up, you don't tread near him. A lot of deadly snakes, you can tread near them, they'll escape. A lot of them will put up and, and have a go at you. They're not aggressive, they're defensive. And their defense is being aggressive. Given the deadly reputation of venomous snakes, why is it that snakes are the most common exotic animals kept in captivity? John's unique family story goes some way to answering this. John Can has been living with snakes all his life. The Can family has worked with snakes for almost 100 years, and John's father, George, took over the snake show at La Perouse from 1920, which is still operating today at the same site in Sydney, Australia. The original show was promoted as the snake pit of death, guaranteed to draw a crowd. John and his brother George Jr. have been extremely close to snakes their whole life. So much so that John is a leading expert and author on the subject of snakes and other exotics. Since his retirement from the snake shows in 2010, John has had more time to concentrate on writing books about these cold-blooded reptiles that have fascinated him since childhood. Dad started when he came back from the First World War. He's still in the Army in uh, February 19 come back from France. There was nobody doing the snake show and he was the snake man by then. So he went and caught a few snakes and set up the pit at the La Perouse. And Mum used to be the Cleopatra. She was the first snake show lady in Tasmania when she was 13. Mum worked on the same showground as Dad and down the track they got married. Whenever Dad was bush, Mum used to do the show at La Perouse. Never with real bad snakes, I can assure you. She probably had pythons and a few black snakes. It's uncommon for exotic pet ownership to cross over many generations. But for John Can, the handling of dangerous snakes is a family tradition. The collection of snakes includes some of Australia's deadliest species. We got most of our snakes from around here, but we used to travel the country a lot when we was getting snakes for milking. We used to go to different lake countries in New South Wales, down into Victoria. But uh, generally speaking, we used to get local snakes. When they weren't using local snakes in the show, John and his dad regularly traveled into the countryside looking for new exhibits to include. When I was a kid, I was in a swamp in Nara one time. I was probably about, I don't know, eight, nine year old. And Dad used to always hunt with his trousers that roll up around his legs. And he was in the water where this big black snake was. He was over two metres thicker than your arm. And Dad was battling to get that snake in the bag. But he said, pull my trousers down. And before he knew it, I unbuckled his belt and pulled his trousers down. He, his trousers were floating in the bloody water. And <laughs> he didn't see the funny side of it. Later on, he always said, roll me trousers down. <laughs> the diamond python has a stunning skin coloration, which makes it an attractive option as a pet. They can often be found in the roof spaces of houses, an unwelcome surprise for unsuspecting homeowners. 
The keeping of dangerous snakes is a risk, and yet their popularity as pets is grown worldwide. In the wild, snakes avoid humans, whereas in captivity, they spend a lot of time being handled. But are all snakes the same? Is it possible to completely tame a snake? They all have their own temperament, whatever mood they're in, but some of our deadliest snakes do quieten down in captivity after a time, and people, on my opinion, carelessly put the venomous snakes around their neck, and as I photographed in one of my book, a friend of mine kissing a tiger snake, and that's the snake that killed him. So you can never be certain they're not going to bite even when they're quiet. I have had friends of mine in comas for weeks and weeks after a spitten by a snake they reckon would never ever bite them. So. Rob, who is one of the current snake handlers at La Perouse, also works as a professional snake catcher and knows what's required to safely manage these reptiles. The experience of being bitten by a snake can sometimes be uh, a good lesson. Best avoided, but I have been bitten by venomous snakes. Out of thousands of snake species, that are many of them are harmless, I could have been bitten by many harmless species. But I think what people are trying to ask is, have you been bitten by venomous snakes? And the answer is, yes. I'd, it'd be sort of weird if you hadn't, in a way, to be so involved with snakes and never actually experience that part of, and I don't recommend it in any way. Don't go and get yourself bitten by a snake. Our only highly venomous ambush predator is this historical snake. But it's got the worst name of any snake in history. This snake is called the Death Adder. One of the fastest striking snakes in the world. And they are quite venomous. If you measure the toxicity of their venom, and the best way I can describe how venomous a Death Adder is, is by how many people used to die from its bite. The death rate from death out of bite before the invention of anti-venom was apparently 50% fatality rate before the invention of anti-venom. Even when you're an expert with snakes, it must be remembered you could be dealing with a venomous snake that won't hesitate to bite if they feel threatened. John's dad survived the ordeal of being bitten by a tiger snake. He had a very bad bite from a big tiger snake on the, on the ankle there, and the snake really hung on and gave him a lot of venom, and all he did was say to his friend who was with him at the time, don't tell the missus about it, you know? that she knew, she could see the look on his face that he was, he was bitten. But that bite would have killed a normal person, I would say, it could have been within 10 minutes, it could be an hour or two, but it was a bad bite from a big cranky snake. Tiger snakes, one of the world's deadliest snakes, are highly venomous and found in subtropical and temperate regions of Australia. Tiger snakes are dangerous, but people do keep them as pets. They appear intimidating, fearsome, but it is mostly a bluff. Experts will say that you do need a high level of experience in snake handling before you even think about keeping a venomous species. Is a snake recommended as an ideal pet? As with most exotic animals, it requires a special kind of person that's prepared to provide the right environment for them to live in. But unlike a domestic cat or dog, a snake will never come looking for any affection from its human. If you like snakes, that's the only way you can call them a pet. They'll never get to know you. 
A lot of people get the impression that snakes do know you or don't believe it. They'll, they'll come to you when you open their cage or their door or whatever. They think you're going to supply them with food. Some snakes will bite you when they're really hungry uh, by mistake but soon let you go. We're talking about non-venomous snakes. But generally speaking, they make a good pet, you know, as long as you can look after them properly and you've got the right facilities to do so. Yeah, I would definitely say snakes make good pets. Depends on who you are, but they're more catered to somebody who has an interest in natural history. See, a dog or a cat is for people who just need something and it has to do something for them. With a reptile, especially a snake, it's more of an interesting creature from a scientific point of view. They're interesting in their reproductive biology, in their behavior. They're low maintenance, so they, they actually make quite good pets. John Cant is a responsible owner with an enormous amount of experience. He has always been around snakes and other exotics. And in some way, this has definitely enhanced his lifestyle. Snakes evoke fear, but for John, they are a constant joy and a pet that in most cases are easily handled. Knowing how to handle a snake properly is important. Allowing them to move freely is recommended, as it will soon let you know if it isn't comfortable. You never restrict their movement. If I stopped him from moving, he would get cranky about it maybe not bite me. If I held it long enough, he probably might. I don't know, I'm not gonna try it out. But uh, irrespective of that, you never restrict a snake from moving, unless it's a venomous snake and you got him by the tail, and you're trying to keep his head away from you, you hold him by the body. But um, as a so-called pet, or that python, you don't, don't restrict their movements. John's diamond python is from the python family which are non-venomous and known as constrictors. Tightening slowly around their victim, constrictors coil their body around the prey until they are suffocated and ready to consume. Pythons can swallow prey bigger than the diameter of their own heads, which broadens the possibilities of a hearty meal. The snake pit at La Perouse provides the opportunity for the public to get up close and personal with some of Australia's deadliest snakes in a controlled environment. Rob recalls the impact his snakes have on the public that come to see the shows. People react here to snakes a lot better than they do when it's in their house. A snake in a snake show is always, people react to it much better because it's in a controlled situation uh, and there's a snake handler there. If you bring the snake over to the wall to show them, they step backwards at the same rate. And some people even scream uh, when the snake heads in their direction. So the people are as highly variable as the snakes are. Well, they're all very curious. I often used to get the impression at times when people are a bit disappointed you never got bitten, <laughs> which is probably could have been true. I, I, I'd like to think I was wrong, but they're interested on the educational aspect of it. The shows at La Perouse have been entertaining people for generations. These days, the shows educate people about some of Australia's deadliest snakes that are kept safely tucked away in bags at the snake pit, waiting for their turn to draw gas from the spectators. As each snake is displayed, Rob explains the characteristics of the species and exposes some common misconceptions about snakes. Safety is always top of mind when working with these reptiles. And even though he knows their behaviors well, there's always the slim chance he could get bitten. They have to be respected at all times. 
But as far as John is concerned, a lifetime's fascination with snakes proves that even this misunderstood and often feared predator can become a unique part of the family. Just don't expect them to fetch a ball. Australia's largest island, Tasmania, is home to some of the world's strangest animals. And sadly, it's best known for the demise of the most well-known marsupial, the Tasmanian tiger. Extinct since the 1930s, it may come as a surprise that they were once kept as pets. But even this could not guarantee the species' survival. The debate around exotic animals as pets is now centered on the other recognizable Tasmanian animal, the Tassie Devil. The keeping of native animals in Australia is a hot topic, but maybe the best opinion on this comes from someone who works with the devils every day. Alicia looks after a colony of devils, and one in particular is young Hurricane. This here is baby Hurricane. He is a Tasmanian devil. He's approximately five months old, we believe. Um, so he is being hand raised by me at the moment. So he comes to work with me every single day. And then when I go home at night, he comes with me as well. He's being bottle fed around five to six times a day, every four to five hours. So uh, he needs constant care, constant warmth. He's got a little hutch that he lives in when he's at home with me, which has a heat pad and, and lots of blankets and, and soft toys and things in there for him as well. Hurricane is cute, but Alicia does know that his bite is as bad as his squeal. Tasmanian devils actually have the strongest jaw of any animal relative to their size. The second strongest jaw belongs to the tiger. Therefore, pound for pound, Tassie devils can actually bite you harder than a tiger. An average adult male weighs in at around 18 pounds. Its muscular build and strong jaws mean it can tear into wombats weighing up to 65 pounds. You pop him down on the ground and it's natural instinct for him to want to chase you. So what he'll do is he'll chase me for as long as he needs in order to, to find my leg and climb back up my body. So he comes home with me and, and terrorizes my living room. <laughs> He likes to intimidate you, so that's Tasmanian's devil's game, basically. They like to open their mouth wide and show you their big teeth. They like to make really terrifying noises in front of your face. He likes to approach and likes to try to scare you out of his territory if he doesn't want you to be in there. If he does bite you, it's going to hurt. <laughs> um, it's probably going to scar as well, so you need to watch those signs really carefully and make sure that you are safe while you're in there. Devils could be good pets. Their size, the sleeping habits, and what they eat is similar to that of a pet dog. But unlike dogs, when Hurricane reaches sexual maturity, a different approach is needed. He's going to be fine for at least two years until sexual maturity kicks in. And, and then he's not going to be aggressive. He's just not going to be friendly anymore. So I would not be able to hold him up like a baby with his face next to mine and feel confident um, that there isn't a chance that he would bite me. Once sexual maturity kicks in, he, he turns back into a, a wild sort of devil and um, his sexual instincts kick in and, and that becomes his main priority. If I enter an enclosure where a female is or where he can smell a female, then I then become a threat to his chances to having that female and he does become a little bit more aggressive and, and will want to remove you from his enclosure. I actually hand raised Hurricane's mum and dad, so I was comfortable with them for a long time. 
His dad was very comfortable with me until sexual maturity hit uh, at around two and a half years old. I could still pick him up, he'd climb up my leg and, and be happy to have a cuddle, um, just like your friendly dogs and cats at home, until about two, two and a half years old. And then once he started to feel like a, a big boy, it became very unsafe to go in with him then. So that's his natural instinct, he wants to grab on. I have a little bit of arm in there, <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty painful, it's like a vice-like grip at the moment. Um, he doesn't want mum to leave him behind in the wild, so he needs to latch on with all his might. Uh, obviously if another animal wants to come by and eat him, uh, they're going to want to pull as hard as they can to get him off mum's back. So uh, once he latches onto something, there's a vice-like grip there, um, so if he gets my finger or if he gets my arm, you just got to leave it there until he's done, basically. <laughs> There's little doubt that a tight grip could cause serious injury. The devil's bite force is an obvious deterrent to human contact. It's less damaging, but when they're adults, you definitely don't want them to bite you. So you're always watching their behavior to make sure that they're not showing any aggressive signs like that. As adults, if they were to bite you, it's usually just a warning bite. They'll bite you in an attempt to scare you, and then they're going to let go straight away. So they're not going to hold on, uh, which is wonderful, because otherwise you could end up with some broken bones, depending on where they were biting you if they really wanted to. Welding gloves is one good thing that you should always be wearing if you are going to have to handle the devil. It's not going to help you too much, um, but it's going to help a little bit. Holding them at the base of their tail is the safest place, if you can get to it. Although it's illegal to own any endangered native Australian animals, it's more the Tasmanian devil's temperament that protects it from private animal ownership. Usually people do try to push the boundaries with things like that. Probably people are a little bit too scared with Tasmanian devils. Tasmanian devils tend to have a really bad name. They'll stand in front of you, they'll open their mouth really wide and they, and they want to try to intimidate you. <laughs> People will tend to see that sort of behaviour and, and tend to think, I don't want to go anywhere near that Tassie Devil, so I don't think anyone really even wants to have them as pets, which is good. Sure, yeah, so Tasmanian Devils, of course, you cannot have them as a pet. You can't have any native wildlife as a pet. The Australian government just does not allow you to do that. It encourages then people to illegally take those animals out of the wild, which you want to decourage, of course. So Tasmanian Devils especially you cannot have. They're an endangered species. They're quite a tricky species to look after and they're dangerous as well. So if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know those warning signs as they get older, a lot of damage can be done um, to yourself, younger children, other animals and things like that as well. Some believe that devils could be taught not to be so aggressive and be as calm and domesticated as a family pet. Twinkle was one such pet. She lived with her owner, Mike Jago, for many years. Her behavior was perfect, up until just after her first birthday. Mike came home one day to find Twinkle had destroyed his leather lounge. When the thylacine died out, the Tasmanian devil took over the title of the largest known carnivorous marsupial. But where the thylacine's relatively docile nature made it suitable as a domestic pet, even hand-reared devils are far from safe to be around. Some experts say that had devils been domesticated for generations, they may have become more predictable and better behaved. Domestication may also help in saving the species. It is estimated that 90% of all devils in the wild are affected by an aggressive cancer which is threatening their existence. Many believe we are witnessing the demise of a species and that captive animals may be the only way forward. Private ownership may still be a possible solution to the conservation of other species, but the issue remains contentious. Is domestication really a viable solution? 
In some states here in America, it is outright legal to own just about anything. Well, that doesn't make it okay, and it doesn't make it beneficial to the animal. Just because it's legal doesn't make it right, and we know that. You know, animal ownership is certainly uh, you know, underscores that, and it, it's an evolution, you know. The understanding of the care, uh, the welfare that goes into a lot of these animals, it's an evolution, and it takes time. Tigers and lions, for example, have been successfully bred in captivity, but none have ever been reintroduced to the wild. To save cats, you've got to have that entire ecosystem intact. Any part of that food chain is out, and the cats are going to die. So uh, keeping animals in their own habitat is by far the, the best way. Alicia and Hurricane have formed a bond that may just be a positive sign for this much maligned species. I'm mum to him now, yep. So he knows my scent. Um, he's pretty happy to be hand raised by me if somebody else has to give him a bottle uh, for any reason, just for one of those times. He tends to be a little bit more frustrating because uh, it's a different smell to him. Um, obviously everyone has a little bit of a different technique as well. So he prefers consistency. He likes to be hand raised by only one person. Uh, it does work best for him um, in order for him to, to grow and develop as he's supposed to. I feel like I'm really, really lucky. Tasmanian devils are obviously an endangered species, so being able to work so closely with a species that's so special and so unique um, is really awesome. And also working with them, you know you're actually doing something to help them in the wild as well. So um, I also help run the Devils in Danger Foundation. So Hurricane will be an ambassador species for, for that foundation, encourage people to fall in love with him um, and Tasmanian devils in general, which is going to, of course, encourage people to want to donate and to want to help save them in the wild. It's really, really important to let people see them and, and gain such an appreciation for a really special species that people tend to overlook a lot of the time. Standing next to an elephant is an awe-inspiring experience. There is a thrill that comes with being so close to a wild animal, a mix of fear and excitement. No matter how exhilarating it is, there's always an element of danger. Charlie Samet is the founder of Monterey Zoo in Salinas, California. It's because of his experience and incredible way with his animals that working not just so close to, but actually amongst the herd of elephants is even possible. Christy, Paula, Buffy. There must be a convention going on down there that I wasn't made aware of. Hi, girl. Come on. You ever been in a stampede? This is the first time for everything. Hi, girl. Move up. Ah, what's going on here? That's gross. This is Christy. That's Buffy. Buffy was a carnival elephant. Christy was a circus elephant. And they just both found retirement homes here. I do have to say, though, from the entertainment industries they came from, they came to us very healthy, very sound, um, very well taken care of. So they weren't what I would consider a rescue by any means. They were just done working in those environments and uh, needed a, a place to retire. Had it not been for Charlie, there's no way we would have felt comfortable enough to come so close to these potential lethal heavyweights. Somebody once said that the day you get elephants, your life changes forever, and they couldn't have been more right. So our entire lives revolve around these elephants. If we're on a boat somewhere in the Bahamas and I get a phone call that one of them is down, we're on a plane home. Doesn't matter, nothing comes before the elephants. It's, they're, they're literally your children. They're very demanding. They're, uh, you know, they are dangerous. When you first get them, you have to move into their lives very carefully. This is Paula, she's our old lady, and it's really kind of funny that she's here right now because she's usually so bashful. What are you doing? 
Charlie started out in law enforcement with no ambition to work with exotic animals. I was a police officer here in Seaside. We served a warrant one night and arrested somebody. And he had a pet mountain lion in the back in his garage. And uh, long short of it, I ended up with it. I took it home that night. Stupidest thing I ever did. I threw a mountain lion in the back of a Toyota pickup truck with a camper shell and took it home with me. I put it in my dog kennel in the backyard. That's where it all started. Hey, what are you doing? Of course, once you've got a mountain lion, why not also get an African lion? Charlie did, and it would change his life completely. The lion turned out to be an extraordinary animal named Joseph, who led Charlie into a new career, working with Joseph and other animals in the film and entertainment industry. Still, he certainly never imagined he would end up owning elephants. No. Really? How rude. My personality does tend to lend itself to doing well with them. I'm, you know, fairly aggressive, fairly dominant, and they respond well to that. They're very comfortable with that. So we've always done very, very well together. But I gotta tell you, we've had some horrifying days, sad days that, you know, we've lost two, and uh, it's taken weeks to get over. What are you doing? Hmm? So I guess some could argue that this is probably my favorite place in the world. You know, it's just one of those things where you can't imagine what it's like to have friends like this. Highly intelligent animals, elephants form deep family bonds and live in tight family groups called a herd. Charlie is part of the Monterey Zoo herd. Well, I mean, I actually do feel like one of them. So as soon as they get to me, they do what they need to do, they say hi, and then I'm just one of them, and then they start doing whatever else around me. The thought of them going out our driveway and us not seeing them again just couldn't happen. I couldn't imagine it. Elephants are often seen as placid, gentle animals, but there's no doubt they can pose a very serious threat. Charlie's elephants are hand-picked in a measure that helps ensure the safety of his team. We never brought anything here that we thought was gonna be a threat to our staff. Uh, we do have one, this one here, who had hurt several people before she came here. Um, she didn't kill anybody, but she dumped a few people, so she took a little more work to be around. So my staff doesn't go in with her if I'm not here. Uh, she's just a little pushier, a little typical, if you will but she's also my, my smartest. She's my thinker. Aha, uh -huh, I saw that. What's Butch doing? Now, here's a good example. These were somebody's pets. They were getting expensive. They were getting to be a lot for them to handle. Um, they didn't really have to get rid of them, but they called and asked one day if we didn't have a better situation for them. And the only answer I had was, you know, we could put them in with the elephants and if they got along fine, if they didn't, we'd have to turn around and bring them right back. That was, what, 10 years ago? And there are days we come out here and the elephants are resting their trunks on them. Now you're gonna hear a lot of noise probably when the boy comes forward. Mood changes quickly as there is a sudden commotion from the elephants.
that beat. Christy? Easy, you had a girl. But be back. back. This is Butch. And he's what we call big. What happened is there was a tractor back there that spooked Butch. He obviously told the girls and they ran running over there to help him. Ah, huh. you big dork. So you see, in a lot of the larger organizations, accrediting organizations, what we're doing right now shouldn't be happening. But where I come from in the entertainment industry, you're never gonna remember knowing elephants from looking at them from a barrier in a zoo like you will today. Um, you gotta meet them to know them. And you gotta know them to wanna help save them. And so, hey, there's humans back here. Charlie has worked with exotics for more than 30 years, and the trust these animals have in him is remarkable. Surely, it must take a special sort of person to be so trusted by a herd of elephants. I do think you have to have the right personality for it. Um, but they're smart, so there is somewhat of a science to it. And if you apply the science, if you learn it and apply it, it works. Uh, we don't do, we don't handle them the way we used to. It's evolved like everything else. Uh, it's a far, a far kind, kinder training now than it used to be. But for the most part, um, yeah, I'd almost say it's somewhat easier than big cats because they're so smart that it removes a lot of the things you have no control of, and uh, you can, you can actually apply a little tiny bit of trust. They're like a horse. They're, you, know, if you, try, you try to get a horse to step on you or to run you over. I had, to ha I had a scene once where I had to have a horse charge into me and knock me down. It took us days to find one that would do it. Um, they just instinctually have no interest in hurting you. Um, but on the other hand, they're like children. You have to be their parent before you can be their friend. So you have to find that balance where they respect you enough to know that they have to listen and they have to behave but there's a reward for it, you know? And they're smart enough to learn real fast. It works a lot better that way. Charlie spent years building up his rapport with his elephants, and keeping elephants is a full-time job. In fact, it's a full-time job for several people. Well, here's the problem. We're working with them all day. They're working, their minds are being kept busy. 24-7, we're working with them. And if you don't, they start pushing you around. And then it gets out of hand. Then you lose control, and that's when they become real dangerous. Butch says, I just want to help. Huh. Huh. Big door. So, again, you can't go to work every day and spend what little time you have left with an elephant. You, you have to be doing it full time. You have to be doing it professionally for a living to keep them manageable. Um, but on the other hand, do we treat them like pets? We treat everything like pets, but we do it professionally. Spending so much time with his elephants, Charlie is completely at ease with them, but he's always alert to possible dangers. Now, when they all came running, when they all went running that way towards Butch and Christy was in the middle of it, uh, I won't lie to you, I had a little concern there. That's a lot of elephant and very little Christy. So I headed that way. But once again, we've never had a, a bad day. We've never had an incident. They did just what I thought they were gonna do. They ran to Butch because they thought he had a problem. Charlie's closeness to his elephants is as much about enriching their lives as it is about enriching his. 
the best mental stimulation they have is us. The second best mental stimulation they have is the other animals. And the third is themselves, uh, the, the group. So, but they have a lot of things to do here. In the morning, my elephants deliver breakfast to the bed and breakfast. Um, so they go up and they visit with people. Their breakfast baskets have bags of fruit that they get to share with the elephants. So there's the positive. That's why they walk up there with us and they're happy to do it. In the afternoon, people get to come and help us give them baths. And then um, at night, they go to bed. They get their treats and they go into their barns and they go to bed. So. This elephant is normally so shy, she'd be standing back over there and I don't even try to make her come visit people. I have no idea what she's doing right now. She's obviously a camera hog. Paula, what's this about? Paula and Christy came together. Both came from circus. Christy back. Christy back. And there were some things we've changed. Like in circuses, they're not allowed to touch things with their tusks. Whereas in our environment, it was OK. So it took a while to teach her that this was OK. We're, uh, we're far more lenient than they needed to be in circus. So uh, if you will, they get away with a lot more. But we just cut it off at a certain point so that we keep the control and we keep enough respect so it's still a safe activity. There are more than 100 exotic animals at Monterey Zoo, and Charlie claims not to have favorites. Watching him with his elephants, it becomes very obvious that maybe, just maybe, he does. Some, some might say they're the flagship of our zoo. Uh, a lot of elephants, a lot of zoos have elephants, but I, I don't know. I, you know. Everybody finds their magic in a different animal. Some people adore elephants, but some people would get on a plane and travel here for nothing more than those sloths. It's, it's just wherever you find your magic. Ethan may only be a child, but he's about to do something many adults wouldn't ever consider. He's about to risk his life. Ethan is at his grandfather's rural property, where cattle would not be out of place. But these are not your average cattle. Ethan's grandfather, Dwayne, raises about 40 Watusi cattle on his Utah ranch. Putting a 10-year-old within reach of an animal of this size and temperament is a risk. But for Dwayne and Ethan, it is a calculated risk. Also known as the cattle of kings, an average Watusi weighs around 1,000 pounds, and their horns are the largest and most dramatic of any breed of cattle. That's exactly what makes them one of the most dangerous. Even Dwayne is wary. I can get a little bit closer, but this cow's getting ready to have a calf, and I know her. I get halfway over there, she's gonna chase me out. That cow there will just take her baby and run. This new baby here, her mother would probably let us go up to her, but they are threatening because they're showing you. When they have a baby, you respect that, okay? Uh, you do not play with the babies. We play with one here because we know this cow. I mean, she was bottle raised. These cows here, you know that they're not gonna let you play with their baby. These cattle through the years, because of a lot of times, the predators that are in Africa, the hyenas, okay? The mothers have become very, very protective. This little cow behind us, she's showing you, she does not want you to play with her baby. And so as protective as the mothers are, the bulls are really docile. They don't care. You can take that baby, but with the mama, you're not gonna play with it. So why does Duane let his grandson climb into a pen with one of these potentially lethal beasts? 
It seems a common theme among owners of dangerous animals. Familiarity breeds trust. This little cow's name is Tina, and she was bottle raised, okay? And that's why she's so gentle. Uh, my grandson Ethan here, he raised her on a bottle. This is his cow. And she just uh, had a little baby calf just three days ago. Do you want to catch the calf, Ethan? Now, you can see the little horns are already starting right here. You can see some real good growth on them as a year old. They'll be uh, a year old. They should be out, you know, anywhere from uh, eight to 10 inches long and have a base on them probably like that. The breed does well in the Utah climate and it is prized for its good looks its robust and drought-hardy nature, and for those, massive horns. Uh, we started raising these in 1982. We've uh, learned a lot about the Watusi, and uh, you know, actually, uh, uh, a few years ago, we, we sent semen back to South Africa, where these animals originally come from, uh, to get new bloodlines in, into a, a herd over there. We've understood that in Africa, they're after you know, it, it's a thing of economics. Great big horns, great big long horns is harder for the animal to travel, to feed. And so they're in Africa, they're breeding the horns smaller. Yet in America, because we have an abundance of feed, we want our horns bigger. <laughs> and Dwayne certainly succeeded in breeding cattle with bigger horns the world's largest, in fact. Dwayne's bull, Woody, earned him a place in the Guinness Book of Records for the largest horn circumference ever recorded. Woody's left horn far outsized its right-hand counterpart, growing to a massive circumference of 40 and a half inches. Although it didn't cause him any pain, it weighed so much that Woody would often rest it on the ground. Dwayne has also managed his herd to maintain the breed's distinctive markings. If you'll notice the markings on this cow, she'll have this. Uh, she'll have the straight red over the back and the white down the sides. This guy will hold steel. There are pictures of uh, Watusi cattle on Egyptian walls, they date back 7,000 years, and they have this same design on them. And you won't find any other cattle that's got this design on them unless they've got some Watusi bloodlines in them. In Africa, you'll see a lot of the dark red colors in the tribes. The kings, they, they liked uh, the white Watusi. And a white Watusi is very valuable to them. The herds were seen as a status symbol and played a significant role in tribal life. In Africa, the more Watusis you own, it's kind of a, one of those things, I have more than you, or you know, I have a whole bunch of Watusis, and it's kind of like money in the bank in, in Africa. The size of the horns are intimidating. I think in Africa, if a hyena come up or a lion came to a Watusi cow, you know, they're gonna look at that. They're gonna look at their defense first, you know? And I'm sure, I'm sure depending on what would happen over there, uh, you know, but through the years, the Watusis have developed that real protective instinct to their young. The Watusi's giant horns also help to keep it cool. Hundreds of tiny blood vessels cover the horns close to the surface, allowing heat to escape the body. Uh, where these cows originate from, they take the heat very well. And uh, in the summertime, they'll slick right off, and they've got kind of an oily skin to them, which again, through the years, they've developed uh, kind of a natural pesticide. You can actually rub them and brush them and smell the oil on your hands. They are a hardy cattle. Uh, in the wintertime here, because we have so much cold, we make sure that they have all the feed they want to eat and we provide shelter for them. 
they don't have a lot of hair on their ears and they don't have a lot of a long hair like a, a normal cattle would. But you put fat on them, put some meat on them, and they do better. The majority of incidents involving cattle occur on ranches and other sites where people are working with livestock. Hundreds of people are injured and 22 killed each year in the U.S. alone. Knowing the risks of accidents and that the cows can be easily provoked, Dwayne is always mindful of the danger. There is an element of danger. It's the same as any other animal. You take a, a beef cow, they're gonna protect their baby, okay? Some of them are not gonna be as aggressive as others, okay? The same as a dog that just had brand new puppies. Some of them are gonna let you play with them puppies and some of them are not. Again, maybe the breed of a puppy or the breed of a different cattle is gonna determine how protective they're gonna be with their babies. The Watusis, normally you gotta remember that they're protective. You know, you notice how long the horns are and how big they are, and yet you'll, you'll notice these cows don't use them as like a spear. I've seen so many little tiny sharp horns do so much damage to people and yet these bigger horns like this, they'll actually, when they want another cow out of the road or if they want you out of the road, they'll swing it and use it more like a bat. While Ethan has never been hurt by his cows, Dwayne himself has learned some important lessons the hard way. I had my uh, knee replaced and I got too close to a brand new baby and the mother beat me to the fence. <laughs> and she hit me. And all she did was just, she just hit me and turned around and went back to her baby. And that, you know, that, that's when I learned I can't, I can't move that fast, stay away. <laughs> like any large creature, no matter how familiar you are with the animal, its unpredictability is an ever-present danger. The thing you always want to remember is know your animals, they're having babies, and they're protective. We have a couple of new babies over here. The one, the mother took it and left. The other one is a new mother, and she's kind of, she doesn't really mind if you're, you're around her baby, but you, again, you have to know the animals. It's obvious Dwayne takes great pride in his unusual herd and he treats his Watusi with just the amount of respect horns like theirs deserve. One thing to remember, if I run, you run. Yes. <laughs> Please run slower than I do. <laughs> <laughs>It may come as a surprise to some that the hills on the edge of the Cleveland National Forest, just outside of Alpine, California, are home to lions, tigers, and bears. Bobby Brink is the founder of Lions, Tigers, and Bears, a no-kill, no-breed, no-sell, exotic animal sanctuary. The white tiger cub is one of their recent rescues. Well, I thought I was going to be in the hospitality business. I, that's what I went to school for. It's funny, God sends you a different direction when you think you know what you're doing. Bobby began working with exotic animals in 1992 when she took a job with a breeder and exhibitor. She quickly realized that it was not the dream job she had expected. I met a guy with bears and he taught me how to take care of bears, and then he would disappear all the time, and if I wouldn't go feed the bears, they wouldn't have food or water, and he'd be gone like weeks at a time. So I followed him one day. I followed him up from South Texas to the Texas-Arkansas border, and what he was doing is he would set up a ring, and they were wrestling bears, so you could pay $1,000 for the man to wrestle the bears, and then all the other men would bet who was gonna win, I guess who was gonna win, the bear or the man. And then I just, you know, started seeing more and more and more. Because it's just amazing some, some of the places we go and, and the way people treat animals and, you know, they'll have no fur from urine and they're laying in their own urine and they're drinking their own urine and they don't see anything wrong. Like, they don't see that they're doing anything wrong. That amazes me.
Lions, Tigers, and Bears was founded in 2002 when Bobby rescued two endangered Bengal tigers. Only Bobby's direct intervention and negotiation with the owner saved them. They were backyard pets. They were housed in a six by 12. Uh, no shade, no shelter. You and I couldn't live like that for five or six years. And the guy was threatening to shoot the animals if the fish and U.S. Fish and Wildlife didn't leave him alone because he considered them his property. But they worked it out, and he decided that we could take the tigers. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife gave us 30 days, and that's when we built that first small enclosure. You know, because we only had 30 days to get the permits, cross the state lines, build something to house the tigers, and get them and get them here. And that that was the start. We like to say here they go from rags to riches, because the animals we take here are usually the the ones that nobody else will take. There's no place for them to go because we work all over the country with the first responders. I've probably moved 400 animals, all lions, tigers, bears, cougars, in, in the last five years to different sanctuaries across the country. So we work with a lot of sanctuaries, work with a lot of first responders, a lot of state authorities, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Game, even private owners, you know, and we don't judge. If you have got an animal and you're in over your head and, you know, you're ready to find that animal home. and you know, 90% of the time, that's what we see happens with private ownership. Seeing tigers for sale in a Walmart parking lot and at cattle auctions, and seeing big cat cubs used for photo opportunities, Bobby knew she was on the right path. You know, I went to one place on the East Coast, me and my, my friend, and the one photo facility had 22 cubs. So you know they, they can only use them till they're they're so big and then they've got to replace those cubs with more more cubs so where do all the all the babies go I believe some of them go to canned hunts which is you know small area for people to shoot for a trophy or they go as backyard pets they're disposed of some of them are probably just killed and buried there's no federal tracking of these animals the lucky ones get to come to a legitimate sanctuary where they're not going to be bred and at least get their dignity back and, and live out their life the majority of animals Bobby now takes care of have been rescued from private owners and even from other sanctuaries. An appointment with the vet is one of their first experiences at their new home. Most of the animals that we go in and get, they've never had any medical care, never, no dental. Like the, the two leopards we have right now in the quarantine, we've spent six months in medical, you know, and then the female couldn't put any weight on her front feet because she had been declawed all the way around. To, so they could use her for the photo ops. And so she was literally trying to walk on her back feet. So when we went in to do the surgery on her feet, we ended up finding a, you know, a lump on her, on her abdomen, and it ended up being a mass on her uterus. And so you know, it just seems like one thing after another medically for her. And we're still trying to get her up here with the other cats since she's been here a year. And that looks like it's cleared up. So that's usually the best sign. The white tiger cub also had severe health problems when first rescued. And after weeks in quarantine, her final vet check before going to a new enclosure is a great game. Now that she's, her lesions are, growing, are coming back. We can do another fungal culture with the, that little DTM stuff. Have you seen it? It's like special augers. Bobby's 93-acre sanctuary is now home to a variety of rescued animals, and for many of them, the sanctuary was the first time they had ever seen the sky or felt sunshine. This is the first time the white tiger cub has ever been on grass. But rescuing exotic animals is dangerous work. Honestly, I think the first few weeks when I worked around these animals, I didn't think they were as dangerous as they are. I think the fear comes in after you experience, you know, a few things. And I think for myself, the danger is when we go into dangerous places and get animals out. 
because a lot of times the cages are so dangerous. We can't dart because if they jump, they'll go through, go through the cage or people have them housed in their dining room or their garage or their basement. They never really think about getting the animal out. Like there's no way to get a transfer cage down the basement stairs or in their little gates. Our cages don't fit through, you know, those are the more dangerous circumstances for my staff. Rather than send her staff into dangerous situations, Bobby often puts herself in the line of fire. And when I first started working with the animals, I worked free contact inside the cage. I have just chose not to get anybody hurt. And a lot of times when you're rescuing animals, we don't even know, you know, these animals past, how they were raised. It's just better safe than sorry because the way we've set up everything here is pretty safe. They work in twos, uh, they'll shift the animal, which means they'll put it in an empty cage, and then the second person goes back and checks all the locks, checks that it's empty, and then they'll go in and clean. And then the same thing, when they go to put them back in the cage, they'll check the locks and then put it back, and then the second person will go back and check the lock. But that doesn't mean that human error can't happen because if something happens, it would be human error. Somebody will make a mistake. That's why your buddy's so important, because that person has to have your back. These animals could kill you in a second. <laughs> in a second. For Bobby, the benefits far outweigh the risk Sometimes an animal's rehabilitation requires a lot of patience. You know, like we had one bear we brought from Ohio, and he was fine as long as you kept him locked up. Like when we brought him in the trailer, we all the way across the country, we'd open the door and feed him, and he was fine, clean him out, and no problems. And then we brought him here, we always put animal in the quarantine and do all their medical, he was fine. But when we put him out in the habitat and opened the door to let him out, he was scared to death. And he'd just run back and forth and pace. So, we would just open the door for 15 minutes and the next day for an hour and then, you know, a couple weeks later for half a day and until the door was just left open. And then finally he would touch the dirt because he'd never touched dirt before. And then finally he would go out in and out, you know, make sure his little safety place was still there. Now he uses the whole habitat. Bobby's priority is always the welfare of the animal. But how is her sanctuary any different to a zoo? I think one of the biggest questions we get here is why don't you give the animals to the zoo? And I think we do something totally different than a zoo or two totally different organizations, but a lot of people don't realize these animals originated as surplus animals from the zoos, from the breeding programs, and that's how they got out into the private sector. Bobby has strong views on the breeding and keeping of captive animals, views that have been established through many years of experience and firsthand knowledge. There's approximately 220 AZA zoos in our country, and that's who holds the SSP plan, the Species Survival Plan, in our country. So supposedly this is the legitimate breeding that's going on in our country. You know, that's 220 zoos breeding. It's a lot. And you know, these are not animals that can go back in the wild. So there's really not much conservation value. The breeding is for the animals to stay in captivity. You can't put a lion or a tiger or a bear back out. They're going to walk right up to you for food. And I don't think a lot of people realize that these animals are not being put back out in the wild. There is no proven plan to put them back that, that's working. And a lot of them, they don't know how to be a tiger. I've brought bears in here that are scared to death of space. You know, it took us six months to get the white tiger to walk out in the open space because she had never been out of a 10 by 10 and she was used for nothing other than breeding. So when she came here and there's the green grass and the pool, and the, she was afraid of the waterfall. So it just, a lot of TLC, a lot of time. And you know, now she'll use the, the whole habitat, but it took a long time. You know, one of the most important things we can give our animals is dirt, you know, it's like, the difference of standing on a tile floor all day versus standing on carpet all day. There's a huge difference, and it makes a huge difference in arthritis and, and how their joints feel, and especially when it's cold. Seeing distressed and mistreated animals takes an emotional toll, and Bobby also struggles with the idea that even the sanctuary she offers isn't ideal. It's just a glamorized prison. That's what it is. You and I wouldn't want to live in there. I mean, it's beautiful but you wouldn't want to stay in there for life. 
you know, when I first started working around the animals, I really didn't see anything wrong with the way they were housed and, you know, people having them as pets. And I think it just grows on you. Like myself, I've been, you know, working around these animals almost every single day since 1990. And it's really obvious they don't belong in a cage. So part of Bobby's goal is to ensure that the animals live as closely as possible to how they would in the wild. They don't make good pets. It's, I think it's selfish, you know, and that's one thing that I've questioned myself about, you know, am I being selfish by, you know, wanting to have the animals? And I had to like get in check and make sure that there's a reason for every animal to be here. You know, just like the little bobcat that we took in Diego. If he could have went back out in the wild, that would have been the best thing for him. But unfortunately, he can't go back out in the wild, so he needs a place to, to live out his life. Rescued grizzly bear Albert suffered from malnutrition that caused permanent neurological problems. And not all of the rescues turn out well. They've destroyed part of his life. You know, the MRI shows he has no pain, but he still has to really think and rock back and forth to get up. And then he has to really think, you know, his brain has to think where he's putting his, his paws to, to walk. I've, of all the animals I have moved, I had to euthanize one lion. And it, that was very heartbreaking because it was just a big, beautiful lion. And he was literally dragging his back legs, you know, to the, to the point where he was open wounds, you know, from drag. He could not move his back legs at all. That, that was hard. And it was really hard because he was in with two females. So not only did we have to euthanize him, but then we had to move the females out of their home. That was hard. Bobby will continue to provide safe and enriching environments for abused and neglected animals already in captivity, leaving future generations to continue to ponder the question of finding a better solution. I always tell my students and my interns, they're the ones, the younger generation, they're gonna make the decision. Do we work on saving the wild tigers in the wild? Because we only have about 3,000 tigers left in the wild. And it would be really nice to keep the ones that we have in the wild protected. Or do we continue to breed these animals for nothing more than to live in a cage? It will go to that generation. And again, they'll, they'll make that decision. But these animals, they live 20 years. So, you know, I figure I can do this a good 20, 30 more years. And, you know, hopefully there'll be some more laws in place to protect the animals and there won't be as many animals in need of sanctuary. I mean, that would be ideal.